I always, like most kids, I always liked music, pop music and all the rest of it, but it wasn't until I heard blues um, via, I must say, through, you know, people like the Rolling Stones and all that kind of thing, that I really started to become obsessive about it and wanting to play it and wanting to collect blues records and used to subscribe to Blues Unlimited magazine and became quite, probably to all my friends, a complete bore about it all. You know, but um, there was something about that music which... Uh, uh, you know, a, a 13 year old schoolboy from uh, from Canvey on in the Essex just, just fell in love with it. I don't know what it was, I just liked it. Who mm. were they? Who were you actually listening to then after the um, Rolling Stones? Well, a real hodgepodge. I mean, I, I, I didn't have any kind of some, some people specialise in Chicago or Mississippi, the Delta or whatever. I, I, I liked all of it. But I mean, some specific people would have been obviously Muddy Waters uh, and John Lee Hooker were uh, both big influences. And uh, the Howling Wolf, when I saw him perform live in Romford, I think I was about 14 or 15, and that, that really did seal it for me. I thought, that is what I want to do. What that big black man up on that stage is doing, that enormous guy uh, with a harmonica and just controlling, you know, a thousand punters in this sweaty room at the back of a pub. That was the most exciting thing, and uh, that's, that, that was a real inspiration. You've painted that a bit rosy. I mean, did he really draw a thousand people in a pub in Romford? It's a big old pub, big old room, and perhaps I'm, yeah, I might be exaggerating, but it seemed like a thousand to me at the time. <laughs> <laughs> did you sort of pick up a harmonica because of Howling Wolf, or? Yeah, I think so. Although at that time, about this time, we had a jug band, um, which played with our, our original bass player, Sparko, John Sparks. Um, at that point, was playing twelve string guitar. Mm -hmm. Chris Fenwick, who who was playing Judd, but very wisely took up managerial duties. Um, <laughs> has he been looking after you ever since? He has, yes. Amazing. Yes. Right. And uh, various other people who drifted in, in and out of the band. Were you still at school or was this... Yeah, oh, this was a schoolboy thing. Yeah, this was weekends and uh, youth clubs and... Uh, but quite lucrative, actually. I remember we used to play at the Canvey Club and busk outside the Monaco and another pub called the Haystack and a pub called the Oyster Fleet, which I'll talk about later on because we've now bought that pub. And um, we, we, we uh, made this, we won a talent competition at our local holiday camp, and uh, great, it was real, real good fun. And then the day, the day turned out that we decided we wanted to go to electric and started having amplifiers and everything. And uh, the jug band kind of drifted it back into a bit, and uh, it became more of a rock and roll band. Right. Was there a moment when you thought, oh, this is great, this is me for the rest of my life? Yeah, and I think this was partly to do with the fact when I saw, saw The Wolf. You know, I thought, yes. oh, I don't want to sing Tiger Rag anymore or, you know, uh, won't you come home, Bill Bailey, that sort of thing that we've been doing down the pub with washballs and everything, yes. which was great fun in its own way. But no, I wanted to start singing serious blues, you know, I must, it came, that that was the way it had to go. But but was there a moment when you actually thought you could make a living from it? That Not until much later. Yes. No, not until much later. It was always essentially a hobby. I mean, we we used to say wouldn't it be great um, I was a solicitor's clerk and Spark I was a bricklayer and we said wouldn't it be great to chuck all that, this in and actually earn a living just by by playing by yes. playing music wouldn't it but it was a it was a pipe dream where do you then play well then we realised that if we were going to be a commercial viability as, as a band we'd have to play some rock and roll as well as some blues yeah so we also incorporated it into our repertoire you know loads of sort of Chuck Berry stuff as well to keep the punters happy and, and also I love it too and I love playing it um, right. I loved rock and roll as much as I loved blues, really. To me, the two things were different sides of the same coin. Yeah. So I started playing in, in pubs and clubs and roller skating rinks in South End and a dodgy pub called the, the Railway in Pitsy, otherwise known as the Flying Bottle, and uh, you know, <laughs> all the usual kind of like rough houses and places where musicians go. And then, then of course, Wilco Johnson came on the scene. And uh, he, he was a couple of years our senior. And uh, had been away to India on the trek, you know, and everything. And he was that. a hippie. He was an ex-hippie. Well, yeah, kind of, yeah. And he'd been to university and had a degree and everything. And was uh, we all greatly admired him and looked up to him as, you know, he'd been around a little bit. And uh, absolutely delighted when he agreed, to, condescended, you know, to join our little band. You know, <laughs> and uh, and his influence in the band was, was considerable um, because, A, he was a songwriter. Uh, and, B, because he, he got us away from being a purist blues band and uh, introduced us to... Will reintroduce us to sort of Johnny Kidd and the Pirates and that idea of a three piece lineup. Mm. Um, no, unencumbered by piano or rhythm guitars, it's very, very stripped to the bone. Yes. Which we, we kind of emulated, um, or tried to anyway, and, and it ended up sounding like Dr. Feelgood.